Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel, Barter Hordes. My name is Robert. I'm here with a Friday Reads check-in, a weekly wrap-up. Um, just a super quick announcement, if you didn't already know, the Book 2 Prize wraps up the quarterfinal round tomorrow. I'm waiting on the last few judges to turn in their ballots, which are due tomorrow. And then Sunday morning, about 10 o'clock my time on the East Coast in the United States, I'll be posting a video announcing which 12 books advance from the quarterfinals into our semifinals round. And then later that same day, I'll be emailing the, the judges for uh, the semifinals round. If you are one of my judges, and I haven't heard from you yet this week about whether you want to judge the semifinals round or not, today's pretty much your last chance, so let me know. We have enough judges to do the semifinals in fine fashion, but once we reach the semifinals and the finals, I'd like to get everybody involved from the judge pool who wants to be involved. So um, I still can fit in probably two more judges if you haven't already let me know and you're still interested in doing the semifinals, let me know. Okay, this has been a good reading week for me. I finished three books. Um, Two of them were just really enjoyable reads, and the third one wasn't bad. Uh, so let's start with that one, since it's the first one I finished, and that was Tangerine by Christine Mangum. Tangerine is one of the books that made our original field of 48 books for the Book Two Prize this year, but did not advance into the quarterfinals, the round with 24 books. Um, and I still have about maybe 10 of those books left to read. I've, I've read all the ones that are still active in the prize, and now I'm trying to pick up all the ones that um, were in the original field that I had not already read. This is a story set in Morocco in the 1930s. I hope I'm getting that date right. I think it's in the 1930s. Um, it's the very first chapter almost leads you to believe that this is going to be a story from a narrator's point of view who's unreliable. Um, her name is Alice. She's English. She is in Morocco only recently. She's recently married after going to college in Bennington, Vermont. And she's talking about how she's not sure she remembers things. She's setting herself up to be seen as an unreliable narrator. And I'm kind of disappointed that I don't think that's really what's going on in this book. She's confused and she has been misled, but I don't think she's necessarily unreliable. And then the second narrator is an American woman named Lucy, who was Alice's roommate and best friend at Bennington in college. And it's clear right from the beginning that something has happened that has separated them pretty dramatically uh, a year ago. And they haven't seen or talked to each other since then. And Lucy shows up on Alice's doorstep in Morocco, uninvited and unannounced, and it's tense and awkward right from the beginning. And so it's kind of a psychological thriller about what has happened in the past between these two women, um, what happens in Morocco, and what they each perceive about it. Um, so it was interesting. There were some, there were a lot of loose ends, I thought, that didn't really get wrapped up clearly in my mind anyway. Uh, and so I didn't love this book, but the atmosphere was, in, was so wonderful. It really does make me want to go on a trip to Morocco. So for that, it was great. Um, overall, I think it was just okay though. The second book I read is a reread for me. It's a 1983 novel uh, from a British author, Graham Swift, Waterland. It's his I believe it's his third book. I think it's his second novel. He started off with a collection of short stories. And I did this as a buddy read with um, Amelia Reeds, who is a frequent follower and commenter on BookTube, but she does not have her own channel, although she should. Um, she is a German reader who read this in English uh, and was reading it for the first time. I haven't read Waterland in at least 20 years. It was a book that I did a lot of research with for my um, dissertation in graduate school, 
I read it first as an undergraduate and absolutely was just blown away by this book. And I wondered if 20 years later and in my older self, I would still like it or appreciate as much as I did when I was in graduate school. And if anything, I love it even more now. Um, this is just a magnificent book. It's the story of Tom Crick, who is a history teacher who has just been forcibly retired. Um, there's been a scandal. His wife has had a break with reality and has stolen a child from the local Safeway. And of course, he, he brings it right back a couple of hours later when he realizes what she's done. But he is being forced out of the school as a result. And this book is him telling his story in some ways. But as a history teacher, he's also talking a lot about the nature of history, why we tell ourselves stories, what that does for us. And then, of course, he's telling his own stories, but he's doing it in a very roundabout way. Every time he starts to get close to something that's the least bit traumatic or what he calls the here and now, he launches into a digression, um, history of the Fens in East Anglia, um, a history of his mother's family, the Atkinsons, who were, were beer brewers, the history of eels, which are very common in the rivers there. His father, who is a lock keeper, uh, traps eels as a sideline. And so it's just this marvelous, digressive, roundabout, re-examination of personal history and national and international history and it is just simply stunning. I love this book. Um, Graham Swift got better known when he won the Booker Prize for Last Orders, but I think Waterland is his best book. Um, I haven't read all of his most recent ones. I read Mothering Sundays or Mothering Sunday, which I really enjoyed. Um, <coughs> excuse me. But Waterland is just it's just brilliant. Uh, so if you have the patience to read a somewhat long book, it's 360 pages in my edition, but fairly small print, um, a very slow building story, which has some suspense right up to the very end. Uh, there's some things that he just does not tell you till the end about his own story. Give it a try. Uh, I can see where some people would lose patience with this book. I think it rewards all your time and effort. It's just marvelous. So that's Waterland by Graham Swift, one of my favorite books of all time. And then the third one I read is a brand new release, 2019 release, The Last Year of the War by Susan Meissner. Uh, I read her book last year, As Bright as Heaven, I think is the title, uh, which was about the 1918 Spanish flu epidemic, which even reached you know, a lot of the United States. And I really enjoyed it, was surprised by it, and so I wanted to give this one a try as well. This is set, well, it covers two different timelines. It's set in the 1940s during World War II. Um, the narrator is a woman named Elise, whose parents were born in Germany and had been in the United States at the outbreak of World War II for about 20 years but they had never felt like there was a big rush and they had not yet applied for American citizenship. Elise, of course, was born in the United States, so she is an American citizen. Um, and then it's about a friend of hers that she meets um, who is named Mariko, and they meet when they're 14. And Mariko is born in the United States, in Los Angeles, of parents who were born in Japan and are not American citizens. So we all know about the internment camps for Japanese Americans or Japanese residents in the United States during World War II, but probably not too many people realize that German families were sent to those same internment camps. And these two girls, in fact, meet in Crystal City, Texas at an internment camp where both Japanese and German families primarily Japanese families, and even a few Italian families are held. And then during the last year of the war, which is where the title comes from, these two families are sent, they're repatriated against their will back to their native lang uh, lands. So Mariko's family goes back to Tokyo, and Elisa's family goes back to Germany, a small town named Pforzheim, um, which is 
bombed to smithereens while they're there. And of course, the, uh, then they end up moving to Stuttgart. And so you have the story of the girl's friendship. And it's an unusual friendship in the sense that the Japanese and the German families in these camps don't mix that much. They, they stick to themselves. And these two girls formed a fast friendship right from the very first day of high school. Um, and they made plans together that when the war was over, since they're both American citizens, uh, they were going to go to New York without their parents. They were going to get an apartment, get jobs, and just be best friends. And of course, the war changes all that. During the last year of the war, they're repatriated. And of course, the last year of the war in Japan and in Germany was the worst year of the war to be in those two countries because that's when the devastation came to Japan and Germany. Um, and this, the things they saw were just horrible. And the, fam the two friends are basically kept apart by the Japanese family. They found out that Mariko wanted to leave Japan and go back to the United States. And so her father arranged a marriage for her and they kept her there and basically kept her from having communication with Elise. And so they lost touch for 60 years. They're now in their 80s. It's 2010. They're now in their 80s. They have not talked to each other since they were teenagers. Um, and Elise is starting to lose her memories. She has Alzheimer's. And her caretaker tells her, why don't you use the internet and see if you can find Mariko? And she said, Elise didn't know how to do that. And so she uses what she calls the Google. Uh, and she types in her three names, including her married name. And it came back with some, you know, number of hits. And the very first hit was a link to an article from five years ago where Mariko had come to San Francisco to visit and stay with her daughter who lives in San Francisco. And she's the only one with that combination of three names in the world. So Elise knew it was her. And so she goes to San Francisco to see if she can meet Mariko again. And so that's the frame of the story. The rest of the story is everything that happened to them during the war and in the years after the war leading up to this time uh, when she finally does, and I'm not spoiling anything, this all comes out in the first chapters. She finds out from Mariko's daughter that Mariko is in the last stages of dying from cancer. And Elise says, it's okay, I'm dying too. Uh, and she wants to meet her. So. I thought it was a, a really terrific book. It's a little sentimental at the end, I think. And that was my feeling about uh, her previous novel too, is that the writing seems a little bit sentimental, but she's not backing off from any of the horrors that these people experienced in the war. Um, so I think it's just the tone that maybe seems a little sentimental at the end. And uh, it didn't bother me. I, I absolutely think this is a terrific book. So if you're interested in love and loss stories and uh, reunion stories and stories about World War II, as I am, this is probably one that you'll want to check out. Okay, I talked about that one way longer than I expected to. Uh, I'm currently reading three books. Well, two, and I'm starting the third one today since I just finished the Meissner book last night. Um, the first one I started is another book that was in the octafinals of the Book Two Prize but did not make the quarterfinals, and that is Jodi Pico's A Spark of Light. And I've never read anything by her, and I had kind of always in my mind just dismissed her as writing either YA or women's fiction, and it's not that way at all. This book is a pretty intense look at a shooter um, at an abortion clinic in Jackson, Mississippi. And given what's going on in the South in the United States right now, this book could not be any more timely. Um, and so it's a pretty intense look at that. And I've, I'm only about a third of the way through. The second book that I started is my backlist uh, selection for this week or next couple of weeks actually, because uh, my little random generator went to my physical TBR and pulled up Little Dorrit by Charles Dickens. Now this is a book I've never read. I didn't know anything about it other than it's one of his big books. And by big, I mean huge, it's a mammoth. Uh, it weighs in at just under a thousand pages in the Penguin English Library edition that I'm reading. So that's gonna take me a couple weeks to read. Um, and I don't really wanna talk about it too much now. Um, 
the title refers to a young woman who is has grown up for the last 22 years when the novel opens in um, Marshall C. Debtor's prison. Her father is uh, an inmate at this debtor's prison, and there you're allowed to have your family with you. And she, so she's grown up in prison. Um, and so it's supposedly one of Dickens' masterpieces, which I just have never read. So I'm giving it a try and, and marking a mammoth off of my TBR. And then the new release, the 2019 book that I'm about to start tonight is Feast Your Eyes by Myla Goldberg. Uh, Myla Goldberg hasn't written a novel in about a decade. Her last one, I believe, was Bee Season, which got a lot of, of notice and uh, acclaim. It's about a, a young girl who is a savant at spelling bees. And um, I was very fascinated by that book. And so I'm looking forward to this one. I don't know anything about it yet. I have not started it. I'll start it later this evening. Um, but it's shown up on a couple of the lists that I follow, and um, I'm looking forward to, to giving it a try. So that's what I'm reading. Uh, I am anxiously waiting for the last few ballots to come in for the Book 2 Prize, because this is my favorite time, is seeing what books go on from round to round, and then watching the series of videos uh, from the judges talking about their experience reading the six books in their groups. Um, judges, if you're listening, please use the hashtag BookTubePrize in those videos so we can all find them quickly and easily. And I look forward to seeing what everybody has. Um, I'll see you again on Sunday with the announcement for the books moving on to the semifinals. Have a good weekend, everybody. Bye-bye.